Good morning, Grace Fellowship. Welcome here. Um, in case you are new here, I will just introduce myself. My name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here, along with Clay, the guy who is doing the announcements this morning. And if you are new here, my hope is that we as Grace Fellowship have made you to feel welcome and that we continue to do so as we worship Jesus through singing and learning about him through the pages of Scripture. So as Clay mentioned earlier, we're going uh, we're going to be continuing on in our Grace 101 series this morning. This series has been designed uh, to help us as a church see how we ought to function together as a church, and we hope it helps you see why Grace Fellowship does what it does. And so if you have the discipleship handout with you, or even if you just looked at our signs while walking into the Legend Center this morning, you'll see that our three main objectives as a disciple-making church are to help you see from the scriptures that true disciples of Jesus, they first of all love Jesus, they love people, and they help people to love Jesus. So in this series, we've already walked through what it means to love Jesus, what it looks like as we love his people the way that Jesus has called us to. And today we're jumping into that third section of this series, which is designed for us to understand what it means to help people love Jesus. Obviously, we cannot separate any of these concepts. If we love Jesus, by extension, we will love his people. That will just happen. If we love Jesus and the people he's created, we will obviously want to help them love Jesus as well. We have, however, chopped these themes up into their own bite-sized pieces to hopefully make the reality of these concepts uh, very real to you in a life-changing way so that when you go about your day-to-day -day lives, um, you will be thinking about serving and loving Jesus and his people. So this morning, as we launch into our Helping People Love Jesus section of this series, we're going to be in John chapter 6. We're going to be using verses 35 to 40. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app with you on your phone, would you turn with me to that passage? I think you're going to find it really helpful to have it open in front of you as we go through this passage. So we'll have that passage read out on the screen behind me, and then we will go through these verses together, allowing God's Word to help us tangibly understand how to help people love Jesus. Reading from John chapter 6, verses 35 through 40. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life, Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Before we dive into this text, uh, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this portion of Scripture that we have the amazing privilege of going through this morning. I pray that we don't take this for granted and that we don't take it lightly. I pray that we understand the heaviness of the fact that this is your word to us. They're not just some words printed on a page randomly. You've given us these words for our benefit, that we could know you more intimately and love you more deeply, worship you more enthusiastically. I pray that as I preach them this morning, through them this morning, that you would give clarity to all who hear. And if there are things that I say that maybe seem unclear or wrong, I pray that those things things would be erased from the minds of the hearers this morning. I pray for myself as I preach that I would be moved and changed by your word and that I would not be someone who only preaches to others, but I pray that I would also preach to myself that as we talk about your amazing love for us, it would change me and everyone who hears into better followers of you, Jesus. I pray this in your name. Amen. So over the past three weeks, we've been looking at what it looks like to love people, and a large chunk of that was focused specifically on what it looks like to love those who are a part of the church, those who've been saved by Jesus Christ. Now today, as we launch into the Help People Love Jesus uh, section, we are specifically looking at what it means to help those who do not love Jesus, those who are lost in their sin, those who are indifferent towards Jesus or maybe hostile towards Jesus, 
And we are specifically looking at what it looks like to help them love Jesus. And I guess really because these three concepts that we're going through are so intertwined, uh, you could have put this under the heading love people as well because helping someone to love Jesus is really one of the most loving things you can do for them. However, we created a separate heading for the help people love Jesus specifically to address helping those who do not love Jesus so they might see his love for them and love him in return. If we're truly disciples of Jesus Christ, we will help people love Jesus. It will be our mission in life to do this. As Jesus followers, we're always going to be looking for new people to join in on this amazing gift that we have of his grace and his mercy towards us. If we truly love Jesus, we're going to be inviting others in to love him as well. I just think of high schoolers going to a party. The party's only fun if all your friends are there. If only one friend hears, if one friend hears about the party, it, he immediately goes to another friend and he invites him along. He's like, hey, we should go to the party, man. It's going to be awesome. You should totally come, dude, right? That's what it's like if we love Jesus. If we truly know him and what he's done for us and saving us from our sin and our wretchedness, we should be inviting others in on this amazing opportunity to love Jesus as well. He took our sin and he washed it away by his blood on the cross. And now we get to live with him forever. We need to invite people in on this. It's so much sweeter when others eyes are open to the love of Jesus and they join in with us in this eternal life. When we love Jesus, we want our friends and family to love Jesus as well. Just like the teenager, if they're going to the party, they want their friends there as well. We're not meant to live this life on an island alone. So as we love Jesus and as we love people, the more we will want those people to also love Jesus. So then why is it when we want to help those who do not know Christ and we try to persuade them of his love for them and we show them how much he loved them by his death on the cross, which was made necessary by their sin, why did they reject it? Why do they not love Jesus when you tell them about him and his love for them? Why don't they take the invitation to the, the eternal party of freedom and rejoicing and worship of our Savior, Jesus Christ? Why do they reject eternal riches with, with Christ? Why, why don't they love Jesus when you tell them about him? Well, let's start with our text this morning, John chapter 6, verses 35 and 36. Jesus said to them, and Jesus is speaking to a crowd of people here, he said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. So Jesus is speaking to this large crowd that had followed him, and in, in, in verse 35, he tells them who he is and the benefits of being his follower. He's the bread of life. And whoever comes to him will never be thirsty. They will never be hungry. They'll be eternally satisfied. He's not speaking of physical bread here, but rather this spiritual bread. It's so much more than physical bread. And in verse 35, he's essentially saying, come to me and you'll be satisfied eternally. No more striving to make yourself good enough because I am good enough. And I'm going to put that good enough on you if you believe me and follow me. No more striving after riches because I'm going to give you riches eternal, life without sorrow, life without end, true bliss, true satisfaction, true peace. You won't need to look for, for bread for satisfaction. I will be your true everlasting bread. Won't you come to this party and celebrate with me? This is what Jesus is inviting them into. And we see that most of these people reject the invites. They reject Jesus. We see in verse 36, sadly, Jesus has to say this. He says, But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. This is Jesus himself speaking to them, and they still reject him. This is the Jesus that has just done a whole bunch of miracles to prove to the world that he truly is the Son of God. He has turned water into wine. He's healed this official's son. He has healed a lame man, and the day before the, the words that we're reading today, we find that he miraculously fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. And these are the people that had followed Jesus and, and are listening to him right now. They had just watched him do this amazing miracle. 
This is the Jesus that these people had seen with their physical eyes. They had heard with their physical ears, and yet they still don't believe him. The Old Testament prophet, Isaiah, prophesied that this would happen. In Isaiah chapter 6, verses 8 to 10, Isaiah writes this, and he says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say this, or say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. The Old Testament prophet here was talking not only about the people he was about to prophesy to right then, who would hear and not understand, but he was prophesying about a future time when Jesus would come to earth and the same thing would happen. In other words, these people, they could physically see Jesus, they could physically hear Jesus, but their spiritual eyes and ears were blinded and deaf to the truth that Jesus was the Son of God who had come to take away their sin. And they would not understand it, and they would not believe him. Paul writes the same thing in his second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 4, verses 3 to 4. He says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So we see that unbelievers by nature are blind to Jesus. They are blind to his gospel. When, and, and when Paul writes about unbelievers in his letter to the Ephesians, he goes even farther than deaf and blind as a description of unbelievers. He calls them spiritually dead in their sins in Ephesians chapter 2, completely unable to see the truth and respond to it by believing in Jesus Christ. So if unbelievers won't even listen to Jesus himself when he's standing right in front of them and doing miracles that no one else could ever dream of doing, How would it even be possible for us to help people love Jesus, for us to persuade them to believe in Jesus? If they won't listen to Jesus himself, if they won't love him after doing all these amazing miracles and he's standing right in front of them, what hope do we have that they will listen to us when we tell them about Jesus and his love for them? We're all failures, even though there should be miraculous life change when we're saved by Jesus, we still fail. And the unbelievers who do not love Jesus will be quick to point out our failures, using it as ammunition against the message of the gospel. You say Jesus saved you from your sin, but you still sin. How can I believe in that type of Jesus? And if Jesus was not heard by the unbelievers when he's standing right in front of them, sinless, doing miracles, we certainly will not be heard when we share the good news unless something miraculous happens. A miracle has to happen. So what is this miracle that must happen that will help someone to understand the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ? What is this miracle that will open their eyes and unstop their ears so they will see and understand the truth What is this miracle that will raise their dead hearts to life when they hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus? Well, it's a miracle, so it's nothing we can do. But rather, it's a miracle of God. The Old Testament prophet Ezekiel helps us to see how God saves his people. And we'll see it's completely a work of God. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, God says this to his people the prophet. He says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. It is God who changes the heart so that when you share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it can be received and understood and believed. It is God who takes that dead, stone-cold heart and gives us a new heart, a heart of flesh, a heart full of life, a heart that loves Jesus. It is God who miraculously puts his spirit in us that we might have eternal life. 
It is God who helps us to see our sin and, and helps us to mourn over it and to see our need to be saved from it. And it's God who helps us to see that Jesus is the Savior we need. It is Jesus who died on our behalf to pay for our sin and then rose again to give us new life. God does this in us. It's a miracle of the blind being able to see and the deaf being able to hear and the dead raised to life. This is what needs to happen for people to love Jesus. We need God to do a miracle. It doesn't mean we stop proclaiming Jesus to them. It doesn't mean we stop living our lives in such a way that shows that the gospel is true. It doesn't mean we ignore the lost. In fact, just the opposite. There is a very important thing we must do for the lost that so often gets forgotten. We need to pray to the one who can do that miracle of changing someone's heart so that when they hear the gospel, they're able to respond to it, to understand it, and to believe it. There is only one person who can heal the blind. There is only one who can unstop the ears of the deaf. There is only one who can raise the dead back to life. That's God himself. So we pray earnestly to him that he would do miraculous works in the hearts of our lost friends and family, the lost of the world, that they would be changed by the good news of the gospel, that their hearts would be miraculously raised to life. Paul writes this to a young pastor named Timothy in his first letter to him in chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Paul writes this. He says, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a, qu- a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So because God desires that people are saved, we should have that same desire. We pray for all people that they might be saved by knowing the truth, Jesus Christ. We pray that they understand the truth and that they know the truth and that they're saved and changed by the truth. We help people to love Jesus by praying for them earnestly. We can see the heart of Jesus in praying for the lost as he himself prays for the lost. He had just finished praying for his disciples in John chapter 17, right before he's about to die. Then he continues on and he, he prays for more believers to be a part of his kingdom. He's talking to his heavenly father here in John chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word or through their word that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. In this prayer, we can see that Jesus has a love for the lost. Jesus has a heart for the lost. So our heart, our desire, should also be that the lost are saved, that those who do not love Jesus are changed, and that they love him with all their hearts. It is the desire of Jesus, and it should be our desire, that the world believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And we should pray for this. So let us pray for the lost. Let us earnestly, day by day, lift up the lost to our Heavenly Father, that He would do the miracle of changing these blind hearts to hearts that see, that He would change deaf hearts to hearts that hear, and that He would raise dead hearts to life. He can do this. He does this all the time. He works miracles. Maybe next time you share the gospel with that someone who you have been praying for, their hearts will have been brought to life so they understand what you're saying and they're saved by the good news of the gospel of Jesus. You see, Jesus not only prayed for the salvation of sinners, he also died and rose again to make it possible. Salvation had an incredible cost. So we ought to pray that more sinners would be saved by his death and resurrection. He already paid the price. It already cost him his life. So the more Jesus lovers and worshipers there are in this world, the more he is glorified. You know, he he would have done it for one person, but wouldn't it be so much more amazing if billions believed and were saved? 
While Jesus was on earth teaching, he taught a parable about a farmer who went out to sow some seed. And he was spreading the seeds out on the ground, and some fell on the pathway, and some on stony ground, some on weeds, and some fell in good soil. And it was in this good soil that the seeds sprouted, took root, and flourished. And so it is with helping people love Jesus. We spread the good news of the gospel. And some of the time, we're going to be sharing the good news of Jesus with hard hearts where the gospel cannot take root. We'll be sharing the gospel with hearts that are full of weeds where the gospel will be choked out. And we'll be sharing gospel with hearts where the cares of this world will trample the gospel underfoot. We cannot change those hearts. But we can pray to the one who can, so let's do that. Let's pray to the God of the universe who can change a person's heart from rock to flesh. He can do it, and he desires that we pray for it. It is his desire that none should perish, so let us pray for the hard and the weedy hearts so that God would change the soil to fertile ground ready to receive the gospel when we share it with them. So then if we pray to God the Father for the salvation of the lost, if we, if we pray that people would see the truth and, and the love of Jesus Christ, can we trust him with our prayers? Can we trust that he will do the right thing? Can we trust that he will be true to his character and that what he does with your prayers will bring all the glory and the honor to himself. Let's get back to our text, John chapter 6, verses 37 to 40. Jesus says these words to this crowd. He says, All that the Father gives to me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing, of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. In these verses, we see that Jesus is very confident in his ability to do all that the Father requires of him. There is not even one speck of doubt in the mind of Jesus that whatever the Father asks him to do, he will do it and he will accomplish it. And he has done it. Every person that the Heavenly Father declares that the Son should have, that should be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, will be saved. There is no doubt about it. Jesus says, everyone who comes to me will be saved. And everyone who comes to Jesus has been given to Jesus by the Heavenly Father. And Jesus is a good steward of all the Father has given him. And he will not let one of those people go lost. He will make sure that anyone who comes to him will be saved. He is the one we have confidence in. He is the one we trust. He is the one with the power to save. And so we pray to God the Father to change the hearts of the lost so they hear the gospel and seek after Jesus and are saved with confidence. We can trust that Jesus will not fail in saving those whom the Father has given him. Jesus is true. Jesus is God. And he came to earth to pay for the sin of you and I that we may have life. So let us continue to spread that word. Let's pray earnestly for the hearts of the lost so that when they hear that word, it sprouts and it takes root and it grows into faith and worship of Jesus Christ. Let's pray the people in our, for the people in our lives that are lost. Pray that their, their eyes would be open to the truth of the gospel so they can see it. Pray that their ears would hear the truth of the gospel so they can understand it. Pray that their hearts would be changed from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh so they believe it. Pray that their hearts would be hearts that are burdened by sin but yet rejoice in the salvation of Jesus Christ. Let us pray that they would be convicted of their sin, that the weight of the guilt of their sin would be so heavy that they cannot bear it. But then let us pray that they do not despair, but rather that they see Jesus as the one who can remove 
that burden and declare them innocent by his shed blood on the cross. Pray that they they understand their guilty verdict will be changed to not guilty because Jesus paid for their sin if they will only believe in him. Let us pray for opportunities to share the gospel with these hearts that have been changed. Let us pray for boldness and clarity when we share the gospel, that we declare it truthfully and accurately, that we don't portray Jesus and his gospel to be something that it's not. I want to close this morning with 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. The Apostle John writes this about our prayers to God. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. God hears us. We can be confident of this. So let us help others love Jesus by praying to the one who can make it possible. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with a plea to change the hearts of those who don't yet know you. We have friends and family and co-workers who we love very much. We know they don't love you, and it breaks our hearts. Would you please do this miracle in their lives? Would you change their hearts to see the truth of you and your gospel so they would be saved by it? Would you also change us to be a people of prayer, a people who pray to you and pray for the lost without ceasing because we know that it is you who can do something about their lostness? It is in you we trust. It is you who will get the glory in the salvation of your people. I just pray that this would happen in your name.